Okay, everyone, let's uh, get started if we could. I want to welcome everyone to the dedication of Peace and Justice Memorial. Although we're not at the actual site due to the rain, your presence today provides moving evidence of the priceless contributions that Bert Don, Esther Webb, Bob Auerbach, and Doug Love to our community. I have a few words to open our program, which will be followed by some terrific people who will speak about each of the four people honored today. We will sing a song after each person is acknowledged. Then we will have, believe it or not, even though we're not at the site, we will have a rib ribbon cutting led by Mary Jordan, <laughs> accompanied by fellow members of our city council. I'm sure, actually, you did bring a small set of scissors as well. <laughs> Always ready. At the conclusion of the program, there will be music, ending with music provided by Melissa Seitz. She has seven songs. We have photocopies, I think, that have been distributed. Uh, I guess the lead song is One Man's Hands Can't Tear a Prison Down. Finally, if any of you feel so inclined, bring your umbrellas or, dare I say, share your umbrellas so we can visit the space afterwards, perhaps after you've had a chance to get a bite to eat or beverage. We say thank you to Bert Don, Esther Webb, Bob Auerbach, and Doug Love. The four trees the park area by the benches are dedicated to them. We also thank the ongoing efforts of the members of the Peace and Justice Coalition and CHEERS, which as a 501c3 organization collected donations for the memorial. Members of both organizations put the energy in developing a concept and designing an area where one could reflect as an individual, discuss thoughts with friends, share ideas as to how we can make a better world, not by the steel of the sword, but by the power of social conscience derived from a sense of decency, a sense of humanity for all, ideas expressed by Gandhi and King. Specifically, thanks must be given to Barbara Stevens, Lucy Duff, Maggie Cahalan, Donna Hoffmeister, Hopi Auerbach, Marge Don, Martha Gay, Bill Orleans, and Ray Stevens. Also very important in this experience has been, have been, David Moran, Greenbelt's assistant city manager, Jim Sterling, our city's acting public works director, and the public works department, without whom this great idea would never have been realized. Additionally, we must thank Rebecca Sufkin and the recreation department for making this room available at pretty short notice. We also need to welcome our city council as well. Mayor Emmett Jordan, Mayor Pro Tem Jay Davis. I know council member Putin's is he's here, to leave. leave. But he was here. Yes, okay. He was here. And I, I too am very fortunate to uh, serve on the city council as well. And we also have to really note, this is really important. We also have to thank, this is the city council, I know everyone is in concert on this, the Peace and Justice Coalition's willingness to move its original date, which would have been tomorrow, when many council members would be attending and will be attending a conference. It won't be raining tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can come back. <laughs> so anyway, we are all very, very thankful because this is all very important to members of council as well as the entire community. The four principles which the Peace and Justice Coalition is dedicated to are intertwined to actually talk to enemies, strive for justice, preserve the environment, and to unleash imagination. None of them is easy to achieve. None of them just happen. They all require courage, and intelligence. There are folks I know who interpret talking to enemies as giving in. Keep in mind, if JFK had not communicated with Khrushchev in 1962, the opportunities for a peaceful resolution would not have been achieved and none of us would probably be here today. <laughs> Regarding the site itself, the three benches are in the shape of an upside down U and are evenly spaced between the trees for Bob and Doug. The plaque with the wording is on a plaque. The, the uh, principles are worded on the plaque in front of the benches. While there is one plaque citing the four principles of the Peace and Justice Coalition, there are also the four trees in the memorial area, with one tree being dedicated to each of the four people. The tall trees in the back are for Bert and for Esther. The shorter trees alongside the benches are for Doug and Bob. And now to describe the trees, after which, for each person, we will sing a song. We're going to lead off with a tribute to Bert. I am also a tree. 
<laughs> and I'm going to tell you, um, remind you why Bert Don is so special. Uh, back in the day, Bert founded the Green Belt Peace Committee to protest the Vietnam War. Uh, you all remember the uh, Goddard Six who put flyers on the cars in the parking lot at the Goddard Space Center against the Vietnam War. In the 1960s and the 1970s, Bert was especially active in the integration of local housing and the county schools. He helped found the Greenbelt Fair Housing Committee and was active in a group called ACCESS, picketing suburban apartment complexes that were not open to African Americans. As chair of the local chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union, he supported African Americans in their effort to improve police community relations. He served as advisor to those people who prepared the lawsuit against segregation in Prince George's County Schools. And for many years, he was on the board of the Prince George's County chapter of the Southern Christian Leadership Council Conference, serving as second vice president at one time. And in, 19, in the 1980s, he formed the Prince George's County Peace and Justice Coalition, which is where I got to know him. What concerned him most was the danger of nuclear war. He worked tirelessly for non-proliferation and for abolishing nuclear weapons. He'd say, I am a rocket scientist at NASA, and I can tell you very clearly why. <laughs> Relying on mutual assured destruction is a bad idea. <laughs> so what can we learn from Bert? He called the Peace and Justice Coalition, coalition because he wanted groups to work together. Number two, his vision was both local and far-reaching. He thought that violence is really a personal matter, and for that reason, he taught conflict resolution skills locally. At the same time, he lobbied for more just laws at the county, at the state, and at the uh, federal level. And he advocated bringing peace to the people of Vietnam, Nicaragua, Israel, Palestine, South Africa, Iraq, Afghanistan. No one is free until all are free from oppression and war. And third, um, Bert, uh, his life was uh, an example of perseverance. He kept up the struggle for peace and justice during difficult times. He kept on urging fellow citizens to action and kept on showing up and kept on speaking out throughout his last years, even when his health failed. Beautiful. Do we know now which song we want to sing? Which song is it? I think Carry It On. Carry It On. So if you look on your handout, the little um, page. And feel free to join in if you know this song. There's a man.
Representing the spirit of Esther will be uh, Marge and Barbara. Marge did a lot of the writing, all of the writing. So you will carry on with her words. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Esther Webb subscribed to a very effective theory of social action with drip, drip, drip stuff <laughs> that, that when we're never cowed by the enormity of the problems, just instead you keep on making your own efforts to solve them every single day. Say, staying as positive as possible. But as well, she can perhaps the most effective thing going, civil disobedience, otherwise known as getting arrested. <laughs> From the time of the Second World War on, she wrote letters to the end. More than 50 of them were published. <coughs> she opened her home to folks needing shelter for a night, for a week, and for years. A generosity that was a challenge to her family. <laughs> her commitment to passive events began when she witnessed the effects of Pearl Harbor tragedy, when attitudes such as suspicion, anger, hatred intruded on a really loving international community of students. She thought <coughs> that the mindset of war was harmed, also harmed the community by taking money you better spend on upgrading schools, providing housing, health care, and protecting the Organized, and then she worked tirelessly in a number of peace organizations, including the Greenbelt Peace Committee, the Greenbelt Committee Against the War in Vietnam, the peace, French George's Peace and Justice Coalition, and the Maryland United for Peace and Justice. She also worked with same, same priests and great members. She, of course, went for all the rallies. For example, she was there at the Capitol Mall for the I Have a Dream speech in 1963. When Esther worked as a teacher and counselor in the D.C. public schools, she took on a mission of getting as many black children into college as possible. When she retired from the schools, her friends asked, what are you going to do with yourself? Her reaction was typical. Now, she said, I can get arrested any time I <laughs> The day before the Iraq war started, Esther engaged in civil disobedience one last time at the U.S. Capitol where she was arrested along with 102 other people. She was 85. <laughs> Be Peace on Earth is on the pink page. The end of that song goes very high, so if you need to drop your voice down, don't be ashamed. <laughs> So 
right, now to talk about her dad, Bob Auerbach, is hoping all about it. So glad the clock is right there. Um, I had a nice speech prepared that uh, Marge and Lucy helped me with. Uh, the point being that we want to follow his example and that it is being followed. Every once in a while, something my father, Bob Auerbach, advocated is entering the mainstream, especially lately. Uh, like the substantial raise in the minimum wage that's been considered kind of bring us closer to the guaranteed minimum wage debt advocated. There's uh, two recent decisions by the Supreme Court, the uh, public subsidy, government subsidy for health insurance and gay marriage, um, taking down the race symbols, um, there's a few others. <laughs> Even the recent pope, this current pope, uh, you know, Deb would not convert it, I guess, but. <laughs> um, and there are a few others. Oh, there was a good example of cooperation, a contest that Netflix had that the only way to achieve it was for all the contestants to pool their responses, which wasn't even the point of the exercise, but it turned out to be an illustration of the need to cooperate. Anyway, I have this nice speech, but I realize I'm his daughter. That's a very rare privilege. There's only one other. This younger daughter, Janine, who gets to be Bob Auerbach's daughter. And it's, I'd rather share with you some of what it's like to be uh, royalty <laughs> in certain circles. <laughs> Conrad is Greenbelt royalty. Um, Joe's daughter was Greenbelt royalty. So some people know what it's like, but in the right circle, for instance, one time in the 90s, my father was at the Hippie Health Food Store in Mount Lear. I knew he was there, and I, know, I wanted something. And I called Glut to ask them to ask, and the person said, oh yeah, he's here. <laughs> I didn't have to describe it. <laughs> and to this day when I go to Glut, it's, I'm a bit of a, it's like being a Kennedy. <laughs> um, another example that you wouldn't know about my dad is that even though he respected animals and didn't eat them, he didn't have the affection that a lot of us had for them, with the exception of his childhood dog, Teddy, who was the smartest dog on earth. Other than that, he wasn't sentimental the way a lot of us are, but he did tell me a story about at Greenbelt Lake one time, he saw a little toddler girl running after a baby duckling, and that the mother duck bypassed the little girl and came over and quacked at the adult mother of the little girl. He said, get your dog, get your mouth, get your mouth. You know, that sort of thing he observed. Um, he was very proud of New York City, even though he was very happy to leave it. He had a car because he had a disability, a mobility issue. It was wonderful to get a car, but he was still very proud of New York. And he told me that when he took my younger sister to see the Rockheads at Rio City Music Hall, and the orchestra pit rises up at the beginning of the performance. He was so he was so pleased with the way Janine went. Wow! <laughs> and he said, yeah. "At Rio City Music Hall, the orchestra pit is a block long." Um, one time, I found him also in the '90s listening to a baseball game on the radio. He objected to television, and uh, I found the game. It was an important game. And I found it on broadcast TV and said, Dad, come in here and watch the game. And later I went to, he watched, when he went to games as a kid, he attended sometimes, but mostly he was watching through a hole in the fence, um, <laughs> obstructed view. And uh, I checked on him later, and he's standing there looking at the TV. He didn't know you were supposed to sit down. <laughs> and I said, how is it going, Dad? And he said, it's great. You can see them all. <laughs> and one more, one time, he's washing dishes, and he had this, uh, he holds up an old dish rag by the threads at the corners, and it was mostly holes being defined by the, and perfectly sincerely, he says, say, do you think I should throw this out or keep using it for a while longer? <laughs> <laughs> Anecdotes. Of <laughs> oh, I, please, may I tell you one more that, uh, Esther Webb was at the March on Washington, but as a tour guide, I meet people who don't live in this area, and they don't know people who were at that demonstration. And I get to brag to them, because I'm a tour guide, I'm at the Lincoln Memorial frequently, and I tell them that I was there, thanks to my dad, 
I was eight years old. And I say, you can touch me. And they do. <laughs> they do. And I've even had people start later on the tour say, I didn't get to touch you. <laughs> so I, I'm very grateful to him. But I get a lot of mileage out of that. <laughs> Your dad touched everyone mm -hmm. in, in a way that none of us will ever forget. Um, so what's the most of which piece? Um, let's fish out this pink piece. It's like this. This land is your land. We won't do the chorus as often as it says here to do the chorus. That would be too many times. <laughs> This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me, as I was walking a ribbon of highway, I saw Sparkling sands of her diamond deserts, and all around me a voice was sounding. This land was made for you and me. The sun comes shining as I was strolling, the wheat fields waving, and the dust clouds rolling, the fog was lifting. Voice came chanting, This land was made for you and me. As I was walking, I saw a sign there, and on that sign said, No trespassing. But on the other side, it didn't say nothing. Now that sign was made for you and me. In the squares of the city, in the shadow of the steeple, near the relief office, I see my people, and some are grumbling, and some are wandering. If this land still made for you and me, this land is your land, this land is my land, from California. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. This land was made for you and me. And now to speak about the unforgettable Bud Love that Ray Stevens. Since Barbara was involved in the uh, talking about uh, Esther, she uh, enlisted me to do that. She said, here, uh, tell the people everything about Doug Love. You have two minutes. <laughs> 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 so I said, well, uh, I could probably explain the federal tax code in two minutes easier. <laughs> <laughs> she wrote this up to keep me alive. <laughs> Okay, on Pete Baker's memorial plaque are the words unleash the imagination. Doug Love did that. He created while working to help the environment and striving for peace and social justice. Doug Love to tell stories. He acted in plays. He created plays. He sang in the church choir, played the auto harp, organized music. A little bit louder. Doug explored caves, lead, led young people to enjoy the earth by spelunking. Remember that. Doug Love was co-founder of the Greenbelt Internet Access Co-op, the Gate, 
Greenbelt Astronomy Club, and as I remember, of the of committee to save Indian Creek and the committee to save um, of Peter Dam Creek, and many other things. He was instrumental in bringing the observatory to Greenbelt. Mm -hmm. He was very active in the Greenbelt Forest Preserve, Save the Woods, and very active in the Prince George's Peace and Justice Coalition as well as the Maryland Green Party, which he and Bob Auerbach started here in Greenbelt. I remember when we used to have meetings at the New York Cafe, and people came from other parts of Maryland, because this was the Maryland Green Party. Community members of Doug Love include this. Doug was spotted deep in the Greenbelt Woods, a lumberjack-sized guy doing secret trail maintenance. <laughs> His cave lamp blazing at two o'clock in the morning. I heard some of this go along about that. He made maps of our beloved woods, made notes of the names of the trails. that he invented the names. He once appeared in a city council meeting lugging a huge tree whip in his arms to make some environmental point. <laughs> Doug Love contributed to Greenbelt's Labor Day Parade, and among the most memorable was a paper mache lamp representing some ill-advised Defense Department Star Wars <laughs> weapon, and another was a world globe pierced by daggers showing wars. Doug Love said, we need to save the Greenbelt Beltsville Agricultural Research Center farmland and all the land of NASA for a future humanity's need of a spaceport outside of D.C. to navigate to the stars. And I'm sure he believed that when the Greenbelt spaceport is built, that the people who go into the cosmos to navigate the stars will take the ideas of peace and justice and the environment with them. So on this pink sheet, you'll see morning has broken. And we'll close by doing the first verse again. So we'll do four verses <coughs> in all.
Uh, before we proceed to the ribbon cutting, uh, I do want to acknowledge, and I mentioned him before, but David Moran, who really helped make this project work. He worked with the Peace and Justice Coalition. <laughs> he, he's not only a great public servant, but he's a great guy. So we were lucky to have, have him at our side. Now, how do we want to do this? Um, we know that the mayor has those special sensors. <laughs> Um, but now the members of the Peace and Justice Coalition want to share maybe holding parts of the ribbon? Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 we're going to come up and just lift up the end. <laughs> after we after we yeah, do their motion. ribbon cutting, um, we're going to be passing around seeds and little pieces of paper that we would ask that you write how you personally would like to carry it on, and also you can share um, your own personal reflections if you like for a few minutes after that. So, and we're going to be putting the little pieces of paper into the, into the basket, um, and we were going to. Pass out the seeds and have the soil, but given the wetness, I think I'm just going to pass the seeds. And what we have is we have we have garlic and we have fava beans and we have sunflowers and okra. Um, so maybe just take a seed into your hand and hold it as you, as we think about how you're going to carry it on. Thank you. I've never. This is the first time I've ever cut a ribbon. Oh, Mr. So. Mayor. Since this was your idea, I expect you to cut every slice. No. So should I make four cuts? Yes. So I'll start here. That's four. Done. Versus Robert. That's good. That's good. You're a good ribbon cutter. Bravo. Yay! 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 This is for Bob. Yay! Yay! This is for Doug. Recollections, and like I said, I'm going to pass around these seeds, and you may take one and hold it in your hand. Um, when it comes to have pots for you to take afterwards, yeah, that you can actually take your seeds pots. home. And pots and soil and yeah. strawberry plants that we'd like you to take if you're so inclined. Um, so let's see. Here's the here are these, and if you want to cut a piece of the ribbon and the string that you're holding. We'd like to go around and ask everyone to sort of introduce themselves and if they have something to say then they can say it. Um, they can also write it on the sheet of paper. Just what we were thinking was that this would be how you personally want to carry on the legacy in your own lives. Um, so. Let's start with um, the mayor to introduce himself. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, my, my name's Emmett Jordan, and uh, you know, I didn't really know uh, Bert or Esther, but I did know Doug, and I used to see Bob around a lot. I was just about to write. I used to see him in, in the strangest places. He was very, very independent, and you know, I'd see him on the bus, and I'd see him around, not just in Greenbelt, lots of other places. And, 
and uh, you know, I, I, he, he's a very humble man, but you know, he, he really did get around, so it's amazing. Um, so that, that's what I'd like to share. Anybody that wants to get up and say something should, should get up yeah. and speak. We can go. We can go around. Let's just go around here. Everyone yeah. My name is Paul Downs, and uh, I'm just going to say some words about Bob. Um, just as a youngster growing up in town, see one guy who was always there at a meeting, at a green meeting, at a council meeting. Um, it was very inspiring for me. Um, that's the only time I ever saw him when he was actively voting in his cause. And about Doug. Um, yes, one night I was in the Green Gulf Forest at 2 a.m. playing guitar with a friend. And uh, we had a little candle, and we hear some crunching through the woods. It sounds kind of like Sasquatch or something. <laughs> and um, I have always wondered who was clearing the trails. And who was, they would, every now and then you'd see a neat little bridge built or something. And there was a lot of debate about whether to clear the trails, but Doug, Doug's devotion was such that he wasn't going to put that stop in. <laughs> and so at 2 in the morning, we hear this, this, this like a lumberjack loping through the forest with a cave or a helmet on. And I never went over to him. And I don't think he saw a lot, but I figured, OK, who's like that big who knows the trail so well? Doug? Okay. So that's my memory. Doug, also the Halloween. Trail. He was always there at the end. I'm sure many children will have his voice ringing in their ears for years. <laughs> and I didn't really know Don, Don, but I did see him once and um, at, 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 at a gathering uh, at Greenbelt Lake. And I, I just looked at him and just knew, okay, that's the, that's like royalty, you know. <laughs> and um, Esther. When I was about 27 years old, I got involved in the committee to save the Green Belt. Well, there wasn't the committee yet. We started knocking on doors, letting people know that the Green Belt Forest was threatened. And I didn't know Esther. I knock on her door, and she invites me in. And I tell you, that was the most inspiring moment of my life. I didn't know that people completely devoted their whole home to to efforts to help people. It was like an office. There were tables set up, and it was just a devotional feeling in the whole house. And um, I asked her to help us out. She did. She came to meetings. She wrote letters. So um, somebody else helped to blaze the trail for me as uh, for inspiration. And I thank all four of them. The Mount Rushmore of my youth. <laughs> I was struck by the stories uh, we heard um, about people who were close to all four, uh, how they, they walked the walk of the causes that they talked about. You know, that they were full time activists, they didn't have time off, as you say, as to this home that example of living in that life. Um, and they, so, and they, you know, and besides their personal lives, they were all involved in lists of groups. And, but I think one secret to the success is after this, they were always asking other people to come join that group. Um, uh, when I, you know, one of the first times I met Esther, um, I think it was the Pledge of Resistance to Central America. And, Imperialism down there, and and he said, "Well, where shall we meet?" If someone asked, "Where shall we meet next time?" And Esther said, "Well, why don't we come to your house?" <laughs> <laughs> so our generation now, now the gray hairs feel more pressure to say we invite you. And I wanted to thank all of you who, in these last couple of years, while we were planning. Um, how to remember the four beloved and how, how to design this little um, gathering area. And thank you for 
carrying on in that quite done spiritual exercise and by giving donations. And I hope that all of us will remember to come and sit at the benches in the U shape <laughs> on a sunny day. <laughs> we will have many opportunities, even if today is not the first one, to go and gather there. Thank you. And I still go up to the observatory quite a bit once in a while and sit there on the bench and think about the way we, the way he used to take care of things here, um, showing people the stars and the planets and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, I still think about him doing that quite a bit and which he was still here doing that. There are so many things and ways in which the four heroes, Hermans, have edified and inspired me and that I aspire to emulate that. I could do this thing. But one thing that special stands in mind is the citizenship lessons that Dunlop passed on to the little ones. And they, I don't know if they're preschool, but they're young. Every Halloween. He asked them, he wanted to like to know who they thought should be our next president. He didn't want to hear what Parasol. They go down the secret ballot <laughs> and put it in his home. <laughs> but there's one that probably will stick with me even longer. This is what I have here. Even more unforgettable are the examples, models that are still living among us because they have been living with values of our life. Very shortly after Bob was taken away from us, by a hidden one driver. Hopi and Janine for a public letter to give up review. Not asking for revenge, not asking for justice. Asking, stating they forgive whatever is behind the person who had that very bad, unlucky, unwise, who knows what. But it was approach hoping that that individual, who we had at that point yet turned to him herself into the authorities, would have peace in the heart of mind. First of all, your name, I'm Gene Snyder. I'm um, sort of emeritus, peace and justice, but I had to drop out of um, activity going to the meetings in peace and justice and the uh, FPAP because of personal reason. And so I'm getting gradually back into being more active. But um, a couple of things that came to me this afternoon was resurrection. Who says there's no resurrection? <laughs> Look at this. And the other thing is, first of all, I want to thank the Peace and Justice Committee that's active right now for doing this because it's been a wonderful day, wonderful hours thinking of these people. And my, I couldn't begin, I wouldn't want to. Some of these things are, you know, too precious to even uh, share, but um, and that's that was just a wonderful opportunity for, that you gave us. Um, and the the word principle again, what you said, uh, Lucy said, is what comes to my thought about these four people. They all agreed on the idea of working for peace and justice. And I want to mention that uh, uh, something about each one that. Uh, Birth, provided a place for us to meet before we had a, a room in the uh, community center. And um, then uh, Bob Auerbach worked on this cause through political campaigning. <laughs> and um, I remember going to driving miles to hear him give a speech about a few years ago, wasn't it? The last time he ran. And, um, Esther wanted to increase her ability to contact others. So we drove to classes in Bowie to learn computing. And I'll just leave it to her family and my family how, how well we did. They, they could tell you. And, and then of course Doug maintained his principles by helping with any peace and justice activity 
even on Saturdays before and after yeah. he had done his church activities. And um, let's see, he'll, uh, well, on Labor Day, oh, I'll never forget all the actors. I mean, sometimes I could see he was, he was almost bent over. He labored so much carrying bags of ice and I don't know what else to whatever booth he was working on. And um, he was just ever present. <laughs> I remember meeting um, at the cafe uh, when Bob Auerbach was running the last time and we would gather there at the cafe. <laughs> It was that we'd, we'd have to sit outside the cafe because Duck wouldn't go in. He wouldn't go in. So we all alcohol, sat outside. Alcohol finished it for him. Because <laughs> Duck wouldn't go in. So we, we sat outside to, to work on his campaign. And I think that's all I have to say. I don't want to get into all Thank you. Lovely things. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? My name is Lolly Gaines, and I'm not going to stand up if you don't mind. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> oh, to carry on um, what I, I knew Esther and Bob not really well, but I knew them. And uh, so be kind is how I'd like to continue on. It's hard for me sometimes. Um, and speak up and speak out about any injustice that you see. Um, that's how. And, and uh, <clears throat> anyway, I lived in Glendale before I moved to Greenville 20 years ago. And uh, we were. <clears throat> I met you folks in Greenbelt, and I met Esther in particular, because um, we were going to the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, I was with the Washington Peace and Justice Coalition. We were representing um, them, and my husband and my four-year-old, we went to um, Hiroshima with paper cranes, and I had put out a call for paper cranes, and someone had come to our house in Glendale and taken a picture of my son, another child from Greenbelt we knew just because I came here for the activities because Glendale doesn't have a community. So it's Greenbelt I kept coming to and uh, asking for more people because we wanted to bring a thousand paper cranes with us. Well we ended up taking a, getting a few thousand paper cranes. But Esther provided some of those paper cranes um, as well as many other people and so I, met, I think I met Lucy at that time. So um, that's how I, I knew Esther and that's how I knew that I need a new community to move to to have community. It's like, oh, it's just next door. It's Glendale. I'm Green Greenbelt where I should go to. And Bob, I knew because you could not know Bob if you were interested in peace and justice and environment. You just knew Bob and that he was running for president and just keeping up to good fight. My hope is that in my now <coughs> undesired retirement from union organizing for 30 or 40 years, I'm disabled, that I can continue as much as I can to do what they have done to the end of their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Since Jean brought up about Dogan, the cafe, I have two quick vignettes. One, when we applied for a beer and wine license and went before the County Board of License Commissioners, they had two complaints only from the whole county. One of them was the local county Baptist church groups who had a pro forma letter that is in every single license for beer and wine and does one. That's why we would go in after uh, they got the beer and wine license. But then before that, when it was real early in the days of the cafe, Doug put on one of the most amazing performances I've ever seen. He came in and we had a little stage up there. He had like a choir robe on so you could only see his face and hands. And he read the entire poem, Beowulf. <laughs> and he had a bag of hats. And every time he read a different character, he pulled one hat, pulled the other one, and he had a big paper mache dragon on a string. And every time it was Grendel. This dragon would pop up, and he would pop up, Grendel, and then the dragon would come down, and Doug would grab another hat, and he'd be the king, or he'd be Baal. It was one of the loomiest things I've ever seen in my life, and it was wonderful. And that's Doug, the creator.
Hi, my name is Leanne Irwin, um, and I, I did not, I knew of Esther, I did not know Esther. Uh, Bob and I met through our friend John Arbach, um, who died before him, who uh, worked for, uh, John was active, working for DC statehood. Um, and um, my fond memory of Bob is going through John, Ar John Arbach's political fund and how to organize all these buttons, because <laughs> Bob collected political buttons. Um, Bert, um, I got to have Bert and, uh, in my house once to, with a friend of mine who was in her 90s, who had never been to Greenbelt, longtime activist, and that was really fun. These two white folks who had been members of the NAACP when it began, you know, and were working for justice, and to have them together in my house, it was, um, I was really happy to have that happen. And, um, Doug, um, Doug did not smile a lot, um, and I, um, I'm easily put off if people don't smile at me. You know, I want people to look me in the eye. I want people to smile at me. I want people to be friendly. I want people to be social. And so my, you know, one of my lessons in my life is to accept difference, and um, and that is working for peace is to accept difference. And the last time I saw Doug um, was at. Fourth of July par party that that um, our friends Barbara and uh, Ray Stevens had, and Doug smiled at me. That was the last time I saw him. He said, "Oh, Leanne," yeah. and um, I didn't know at that time that he was very ill, and so he probably knew, you know, that was going to be the last time we saw each other. So what a joy to have that memory of him smiling at me. <laughs> and um, so that's my practice is to accept difference. It's it's, a, it's hard work, and um, working for peace is hard work. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan. Hi. Thank you. I'm Susan Barnett, and um, so I, I didn't know Bob well, but he was always so kind and pleasant. He did, it didn't matter if you knew him or not, he was always that way. Um, and I didn't know Esther, and I didn't really know Bert, except to see him. Um, but Doug, Doug was, um, made an impression. my memories of him include seeing him at city council meetings and I remember during planning for the metro development him recreating a map of how he saw the metro development um, being which I remember it being very entertaining and very <laughs> dug. <laughs> um, I also remember his letters to the news review and one in particular I remember he was comparing a particular situation in town to him planning to take over a, an aisle of the co-op and redesigning the shelves and using them the way he wanted to use them. And I just always thought that was such an interesting approach to looking at a problem. <laughs> um, and the other thing I was reminded of when Aaron was talking about him being in, his, in the observatory was just his size. and. I always just wondered, how did he get in there? <laughs> how did he get out? It was just hard to imagine. Pardon me? And the caves, too. Yes. <laughs> the last time I saw Doug, we were planning to go to his attic to get um, his memorabilia of helping to save the woods. and. Um, and again, I found myself wondering how that would happen. I just couldn't picture him going into the attic and then being able to get out. <laughs> um, anyway, those are my memories of Doug. Uh, I just wanted to share a story of something I learned from Doug. Um, I'm involved with the Greenbelt Climate Action Network. And often Doug would show up, and at the end of the meeting, he would uh, propose some idea that no one else was really thinking about. And it's like, you know, but, uh, like, something like about we should all go and protest about the Chamber of Commerce or something like that. And then the next time he'd come, maybe he'd say something about Citizens United. He'd say, well, two of us, we went for the city council. And it's like, Doug, he kept getting involved with these things. Like, two people that like, can't save the world. And then all of a sudden it occurred to me, but like, two and two and 50 makes a million, right? So if instead of just kind of like, 
brushing aside his idea, you joined with his idea. So like the next time he came and said, yeah, well, let's do something with Citizens United. And then next thing you knew, you and Haney had gotten involved. And then Rodney Roberts says, well, if you get 50 or 100 people to the city council, you can get something to happen. And so sure enough, we did get the city council to write a letter about uh, Citizens United. And then the next year, he was inspired, well, let's do the same thing for fracking. You know, we can have a moratorium on fracking. Sure enough, we actually have a state moratorium on fracking. But really just realizing, and I think there's movies about this, like, like there's like one lone fool or something like that, and they're trying to get you to do something. But when another person joins in, another person joins in, another person joins in, it will become a movement. And you just have to find those people that have those rare ideas, maybe long before anybody else does. And go, that really has some traction if we just joined in with him. And I really, ever since then, I think I've really committed my life to doing more of that and being more outspoken and not waiting for the groundswell, but finding the people that are speaking out at the beginning and, and following their lead. So I'm very grateful for Doug and his example for all of us. I'm Carol Nassau. Laura mentioned Citizens United, and that's how I got to know Doug. I knew Doug, and, and Esther Webb I knew really the best of all four of these people. But with Doug and uh, Doug's cousin here, uh, and Doug with the model of the Capitol on top of his car, driving through Tacoma Park for the 4th of July parade. We had a lot of fun and it probably made a statement. Uh, it had a sign on it saying for sale on, on the Capitol. And so when Laura brought up Citizens United, I remember that's how I got to know them. And I know I missed a lot of other loony, crazy, wonderful ideas from hearing people. So that is the way I knew him. I had an operation, I got to sit in the back seat, and they got to sit in the front, and it was lots of fun, and it made a statement. I knew Esther the best, um, and I, what comes to my mind is, Esther, of course, was kind and caring and did all the right things, but what I remember most is she cut to the chase. I remember a couple problems, uh, and she went right to it, like there, were pro there was a problem with safe haven where people move from church to church and uh, she said okay let's go go straight to the minister of the church where the problem was and so i uh, we went together and talked to the minister and then there was a problem or there was someone who went and she wanted to help someone who lived in her house and we didn't know exactly how to help him and we had been trying and she said okay we're going to go to steny Hoyer's office and talk to them so she cut to the chase and she went right to the place and she didn't fool around. So I hope that what I write to put in the basket, it has something to do with cutting the chase, not fooling around, and just trying the best to get it done. That's what Esther did. Alexander. My name is Alexander Barnes. I uh, returned to uh, Quaker meeting after a 30 year of absence. <laughs> Uh, the Adelphi monthly meeting, I see a few numbers here. Um, Esther, there is a tradition in our area of Quakers that people serve on a committee for three years and then have an option to leave new for another three years. Well, Bob and Esther had been on the Peace and Social Concerns Committee for about 40 years. <laughs> it, it's been asked about carrying it on. Esther was uh, the liaison, the contact person between the Adelphi Monthly Meeting and the Friends Committee on National Legislation. One way you can carry it on is by signing up with fcnl.org for Friends Committee on National Legislation. And you will get a mailing, maybe uh, a few times a week, and you have an opportunity to easily communicate to your senators or Steny Hoyer, telling them we want peace, not war. Telling them we want to feed children, not bomb them. So that would be a great way to follow up. I mentioned, uh, a Delphi monthly meeting that I returned to after 30 year absence. And um, I had just signed up and introduced myself at the meeting. Um, I'm sure others of you uh, involved in churches will understand this. 
I, uh, after I introduced myself at the meeting, I was greeted by several people, including Bob and Esther. And they didn't say welcome. They said, will you serve on a committee? <laughs> yep. These four were real activists. I mean, there was no doubt that they were going to never retire, and they were going to go as long as they possibly could and work on these causes. And uh, that's one of the most admirable things. I mean, Bert Dunn, we, we have a real meal we've had for a number of years. It's all about all kinds of social issues. He was in every one. What's your name? Frank Gervasi, sorry, he I mentioned it as well. Uh, he, he, uh, he was at every one of those, and he was always interested and always supportive. Um, Esther, we all know, into her 90s, peace activist. Uh, Bob Auerbach getting thousands of votes for president in his 90s. I mean, who does that? You know, that's commitment. That is, I mean, all four of them were so remarkable. Doug, no matter how sick he was, he was still coming to meetings. And, I don't know how many of you saw this charming movie he made. He had it in one of our film festivals about him taking care of his mother. It was so humorful. I mean, his mother was very sick at the time, but it, he was moving her from to, to relocating her and taking care of her. It was just a wonderful movie. Um, and, but the quote I love best of the, that from Doug Love is he came to a city council meeting and supported the, the, uh, the Green Green the Woods, the Green Belt. And he said, I'm Doug Love, and I represent a herd of deer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody else? Because I do want Just the mic a minute to speak. Hi, I'm Neil Davidson. Um, well, at the Adelphi Friends meeting a number of years ago, that's where I first got a comment with uh, both Bob and Esther, though it kind of blurs for me between that meeting and Pink Ranch Church because I was kind of going back and forth, but that's where I got to know Hopi and Janine and your mother, Mary. Um, we became very close friends with Bert and Mark and uh, went with Bert and Mark to concerts on a regular basis at the Baltimore Symphony for many, many years. And um, Bert wouldn't talk about it very much, but he was a very well-known astronomy astronomer. And if I really pressed him, he would tell me about his latest research projects or uh, papers he had recently published or conferences where he was speaking as just a star in that field. And then he was doing all of his piece work in addition. It was, it was really quite remarkable. Um, there's one story I'd like to share. Uh, Jan and I went on a cross-country train trip with Bert and Marge uh, over a period of many days, which was delightful, partly because Bert gave me extra desserts. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end, uh, they said, look, uh, we have some friends we'd like you to meet in Portland, Oregon, uh, which is kind of the end of the trip. So we meet these friends. They're members of the Wobblet, Women's okay. International League for Peace and Freedom. And I think at the time she was 85 or so, approximately out every single week demonstrating in front of the State House uh, for various causes of peace and social justice. So if you know people by their friends, uh, here is a good indication of her birth and mark for all of us. Um. I grew up with Esther's kids, and they were just normal. What's your name? Oh, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> At least for right now, anyway. Uh, and I grew up with um, um, Kathy and with Richard, and we were just like normal Greenbelt kids. But when people like Jay and other members uh, and candidates running for city council went over to the, uh, the house over on Seven Court, and it was like Esther Webb. Talk about a lesson that you would learn. And she took the time and that, that rich Mississippi accent and just a, just a wonderful person. And with both Esther as well as with Bob, who I got to know, like Marge, through Paint Branch Trinitarian Church, as well as with Bob, um, there was this real quiet strength 
but it was so resolved, it was so there, for lack of a better word, that you couldn't help but to feel it. And with Doug, you would feel what he was saying through his humor. Um, a lot of people don't know, but I was honored to have uh, our Mayor Pro Tem and I, we both went to see Doug when he was in the hospice, and uh, Jay spoke of how much he meant to Greenbelt. Um, and that's an understatement. Um, she probably said it much better than that. But it's important to note that um, because we as a community, we really are strongest. And I think this is the essence of the four. We are the strongest when we come, come together. But I have to end actually on a, on a note of humor in talking about making a real great point. It was a school board hearing and people were not, um, I know Doug was not very pleased at all with where the school board, this is how long ago? Is it like 12, 14 years ago? And anyway, he was thinking these folks really just did not have, they didn't have proper eyesight. They were blind. And so he somehow was able to secure the, the blinders that they put on horses. <laughs> and he said, this is what I think about your lack of foresight. <laughs> and actually, with that bit of humor, he actually made a stronger point than many other people who spoke a long time. So, and he was so effective, and uh, just one other quick note. Um, we all talk about here about peace and justice. Uh, one of the plays that um, both Doug and I were in at the Art Center was oh. Canical for Leibowitz. And imagine a play that's not only portraying one nuclear explosion, but two. Talk about not learning. And actually, we're still in that same dynamic, aren't we? But Doug was so committed, and all four of them were committed, and um, we love them all, and we're all so grateful that we had them in our presence. So, okay, we've done the ribbon cutting. I guess are we going to go to this point to enjoying the wonderful refreshments? We're Thank you. One more song. Pardon? One more song. Oh, one more, one more song. You guys wanted to do one man's hands? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> So if you look on your pink sheet in the bottom corner, this is one man's hands. Um, so pay attention to the lyrics, and I'll call out which verse we're going to do. So we will, um, we'll do the verses that I call out. So here we go. Oh.
Hudson. 